Thanks so much. This is a remarkable institution here. I'm not aware of anything like it in the alleged intellectual capital to the north. Um, and I'm particularly grateful to all of you showing up on such a lousy day. Um, so what is all this about? Cool cover, isn't it? Um, thank you, Simon and Schuster. Normally, I'm obsessed with movies, uh, with occasional books intruding when I get tired of being obsessed with movies. And so the question that was bugging me the last few days was how in the world anything as boring as the curious case of Benjamin Button could be nominated for 13 Oscars. <coughs> Citizen Kane got nine. Godfather II, which is a masterpiece, got 11. Um, this <coughs> is a movie of, uh, about uh, someone born as an old man, child-sized, but aged, and then grows younger and eventually becomes Brad Pitt in his salad days. And thinking over what in the world caused Hollywood to uh, so reward this thing, it finally occurs to me they're all obsessed with aging out there. <laughs> they're always having work done and then more work done, anything to retard aging. So here's a movie that begins in an old age home and ends up with perfection. So it's like the, you know their greatest nightmares and their greatest desires encapsulated in one package, and it's been faithfully reported to me that 50-year-old men are sitting there in the theater weeping as they watch this person getting younger and younger <laughs> as they're getting older and older. <laughs> Is that snarky? I think maybe it was. <laughs> uh, well, turning away from such profound concerns as Benjamin Button, uh, why do this? What's, what's at stake here? We're talking about words, after all, not failing banks and unemployment. But I think a small part of our souls are at stake. And uh, I've been accused of being uh, in New York, uh, not other places, about it being huffy on this kind of talk. And I want to make it clear that uh, I'm not setting myself up as a humor cop and I'm not passing out bars of soap. That I love all kinds of comedy, satire. I think it's absolutely you know, essential to our health and in democracy. Uh, I love Colbert and Jon Stewart uh, and, and many others. Um, Tina Fey, all of trash talk is fine with me. It's you know, held within a kind of competitive situation and, and, and in its wild way obeys certain rules. Um, I've praised a fair number of potty mouthed comedies that are like Knocked Up and uh, Super Bad, the Judd Apatow school. And yet snark offends me. And I guess behind any strongly held idea about style, there is finally some notion of what kind of country we want, what kind of discourse we want, what grace and disgrace might mean. Um, I, I wrote this thing very quickly last spring and summer, and I think there were three reasons impelling me. One was I was afraid there was a kind of Gresham's Law operating in journalism and the internet where bad speech was driving out good because it was attractive to people to read uh, this stuff. Second, I mean, also the, the, that, that more highly colored media commentary was replacing news. Um, Fox News on MSNBC, and I, I will admit, I enjoy you know this uh, ascent of liberal television on MSNBC at night, in which Keith passes the football to Rachel, and Rachel passes it back to Keith, and so on. I like some of that very much, but I do worry about where journalism is going. And I will tell you the truth: everyone in journalism is in a panic uh, because it's it's not clear whether we're going to exist in the same form. The old media guys like me are afraid that our beloved newspapers and magazines simply do not have a business model that works anymore. I'm not worried about the New Yorker. I think we're sort of a unique organization. But I do worry about the Times and the Washington Post and all the other papers and the news magazines. And I th I'm afraid that if they sink into the web, they will not have the same authority that they have. I want. I read the Times at night, the night before, but I want it in my fist on the breakfast table in the morning. And I turn through it, and I read a lot more of it when I turn through the pages. And I think we need a central narrative at any one point of what's going on in politics, in culture, in business. It doesn't mean the narrative is necessarily true. And that I, some of us feel the Times let us down at the beginning of this war, for instance. But they do provide it. And uh, 
the internet is superb at correcting this narrative, changing parts of it, decorating it, or even overturning it. But what it can't do, except in very special cases, is generate it, because by its nature, it's decentered. And I think there's a, a potentially enormous loss. All right, so that's the old media stuff. It, there is a kind of panic. Is investigative reporting going to survive in the internet? Is the beautifully crafted sports story going to survive? The long book review, the long music review, the long film review. I can tell you, film criticism is disappearing um, as, a, as an occupation, literally disappearing. Uh, so that worries me. And I think that that anxiety that a lot of old media people feel may produce part of the snarky tone because they're, they want to hold on to their younger audiences, younger demographics. They want to, they, they, they're terrified of feeling like they're a step out of date, 30 seconds behind the zeitgeist, you know, running to stay in place. That kind of anxiety does not produce good writing. And uh, I think if, if it goes the way my worst fears suggest that in this kind of incoherent well of voices in which great newspapers and magazines are just one point of view among many in the internet that snark could flourish as because it's attention gathering. That was one reason. I was in a cold sweat also that Barack Obama would be done in by coded racist appeals, smears. He's really a Muslim, which was used as a smear. He hangs out with terrorists, pals out with terrorists. You remember all of that. Th I felt the attempt was to, as Nicholas Kristof said in the Times, to otherize him, to make him seem strange, alien, someone you couldn't trust, to say he's a black man, be afraid of him. Now, it, th what happened with Barack was that there were so many people who, I think, wanted to protect him, that he was our democratic prince, small d, as well as big d, that a lot of people stepped forward and, and unmasked this kind of discourse, overturned it, you know, exposed it. Um, and so he survived and did more than survived. The rest of us will not be protected in that way. Uh, third thing, reason for writing this book, the whole business of it, the issue of privacy is a very, going to be a very vexed one and a very big story in the next five years. Is our privacy going to survive in the digital age? There are a lot of legal theorists who just gathered at the University of Chicago in November, including some people who are in this administration, heavyweights, who are very worried about the whole issue of internet invasion of your privacy. Um, anyone can say anything they want about you. Anyone can take your picture anywhere and post it. Nothing's checked. There are no apologies. It's there forever, Googled up out of obscurity 10 years later. I'm, I'm increased. I'm upset by the increasing digitization of social space. You go to a party. You have a couple of drinks. You put your arm around the wrong woman or the wrong man. Which of us hasn't done that? Some malicious person takes your picture. It can wind up on the web in a few hours. Uh, you give a speech at the PTA. I'm not talking about celebrities here. I'm talking ordinary folks. Uh, this, this is the way it might go. You give a speech at the PTA or a business meeting. Someone pulls out a couple of maladroit sentences or something that they, you've said that they don't like. That gets posted on the web with your picture also. Um, it's not just Big Brother that worries me. It's Little Brother with a smartphone. Snark is, th is the vehicle of these insults. In other words, no one goes on to complain about his neighbor's behavior in sober, somber terms. Everyone wants to be funny. Everyone, in co comics are culture heroes in this society, and rightly so, and everyone wants to be like them, except most of us don't have the talent that Jon Stewart has. Uh, it is hard to be funny, and Stewart himself probably throws out 20 jokes for every one that he uses. So, or on campus, uh, you know, most of us who are well established in our careers and in our lives um, are not going to be hurt by this stuff. No one's going to unseat Eric or me because of some uh, stuff on, on the internet that snarks us. 